Hello, today we're going to look at Dickinson's poem It Was Not Death For I Stood Up. Now this is a poem that seems to be able to be interpreted in two different ways. Firstly, it could be considered to be what is known as a poem of definition. These are a group of poems by Dickinson which attempt to define an abstract interior psychological state using concrete external images. Now, that might sound a bit confusing, but in this poem, we could consider that she is exploring an intense state of depression, but likening it and using analogies and similes, comparing it to physical, concrete things in the outside world. So using outside external images to portray an inward internal state. Um, and ultimately, she's attempting to, to define the nature of a certain inward experience, which cannot ultimately be defined. And that is the very nature of the poems of definitions, trying to find a definition which ultimately cannot be found. Um, on the other hand, we could also interpret this poem as a terrifying description of death. Actually, this is a poem about the afterlife, about the, the torturous, as, as a torturous place of heightened senses, a torturous place of, of real awareness of, 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 of the, the terrifying surroundings. Um, so it's a very different interpretation. So either it's an interpretation of, a, of an interior psychological state, perhaps of depression, or it's a slightly terrifying description of death and the afterlife. So we're going to look at lots of the different interpretations and you can make your own mind up as to which one you think is most plausible. So, take a moment to familiarise yourself and remind yourself of the poem. Once you've done that, let's look at the first stanza. The, li the first line of the poem begins, It was not death, for I stood up. Now, the idea of standing up would suggest that um, there's a sense that the speaker is achieving some sort of salvation. In Christian terms, death is not death if you're going to achieve salvation. And to stand up might have implied that the speaker is going to be collected to go to heaven. So Dickinson is describing the, um, the process of, of, of going to the afterlife, perhaps, once, once someone has died. However, she, she describes um, a very unusual perspective of the afterlife. She is not describing a typical Christian view of dying and the afterlife. So perhaps she's not dying because she's going to achieve salvation. However, it is not that glorious, epiphanic um, meeting of the Redeemer that we might expect from her Puritan community's faith. This is a poem of heightened senses. There's a lot of imagery relating to the senses. So perhaps the idea of standing up suggests that she has, or the speaker has gained an alert state. She's attempting to define an experience or a state. Um, and the poem sees the speaker's senses slowly awakening. Dickinson attempts to define the experience either of death in the afterlife or this experience of her mental psychological state by repeating this phrase, it was not, throughout the first two stanzas, she suggests things that this experience, this state is not like. So here we have it's not death because uh, the dead lie down. Again, that suggests this idea that she, she's experiencing some sort of salvation or, or some sort of um, experience to, to the afterlife. She also says it was not night for all their bells put out their tongues for noon. So there's this temporal confusion. It's, it perhaps seems like night, but it's not night because it's midday. Um, and furthermore, this confusion um, is exacerbated by the aggressive, jeering, malicious action of the bells putting out their tongues. Um, the bells seem insulting. This personification perhaps suggests the paranoia of the speaker in this perhaps depressed psychological state. So here we have Dickinson's, or the speaker's, heightened awareness of sound. 
In the next stanza, we see a heightened awareness of other senses. One final thing to say about this stanza is that the bells could represent the tolling of funeral bells, suggesting that the speaker is um, aware or, or watching or observing her own funeral. Um, and this suggests that uh, the voice is coming from sort of beyond the grave. It's the voice of a dead person, perhaps similar to the, the voice that we find in I Heard a Fly Buzz. There's a sense of the voice and the body being, being somehow fragmented, that separated state of existence that occurs after death. And this seems to be slightly disturbing. Um, she's seeing the rituals of, of death and seeing them in quite a unsettling way. Here Dickinson moves on to the sense of touch with... Um, the idea of frost and fire, so it's neither frost nor fire, it's neither of these contradictory experiences. And the frost is um, likened to some African winds that are crawling. Um, and this personification of the wind is, is grotesque. This idea of crawling flesh is disturbing, it's unsettling. And furthermore, we have the homophone, cruel, um, with that, that idea of the creeping motion of the frost. It seems sinister. Um, we then move on, or Dickinson then moves on to suggest that it's not fire either. And here, the speaker uh, fragments herself. She um, suggests that her m marble feet could keep a chancel call. Now a chancel is a part of the church near the altar. So it seems that she, um, her, her herself, her existence has become, or her body at least, has become almost a marble statue. It's something inert, something unfeeling, which is a little bit contradictory because we get a sense that she has a real heightened sense of feelings. This state is a state of confusion, a state of contradiction. In this stanza, the senses seem to blur even more. So we have, so Dickinson has explored so far that this experience, either the psychological state, if we are seeing this as a poem of definition, or the experience of um, the moments after death, or the um, the going to the afterlife, um, we've explored that it's it's not like death because the speaker has stood up. It's not like night because it also seems like daytime so we've got that distortion of time. It's also not like frost and it's not like fire. So we've got kind of sounds and, and, and feelings um, and touch and now she says that in fact it tasted like them all. These contradictory experiences have um, been drawn together in the sense of taste. Now this blurring of the senses is either uh, incredibly confusing or it suggests this really a state of heightened awareness, of heightened senses. Now the, um, the way that one sense is interpreted as another sense, we call this synesthesia. Does this suggest a psychological trauma or is it a real heightened sense of awareness that she's getting either in the psychological state or in the um, moments after death? Now, she seems to have seen or watched um, some figures or, or some, some bodies perhaps laid out orderly for burial. And this allows her to, to think of the, the, her own moment of burial. And she goes on in the next stanza to explore the terrifying and torturous rituals of uh, burial. Dickinson suggests that the speaker feels reduced um, in death. The first line reads, as if my life were shaven. There is a sense that uh, the self is diminished. And furthermore, the passive tense here implies that no one is doing this action. It's a disembodied action, which seems, again, incredibly unsettling. Um, something is happening to the the sense of self um, without anyone seeming to do it 
there is this sense of disembodied action here, which is a little uncertain and um, unsettling. And for, uh, furthermore, the sense of being reduced is continued in the next line when Dickinson writes that the speaker is fitted to a frame. Perhaps this refers to the idea of her being fitted into a coffin, but frame has a connotation of torture, possibly a rack um, or some sort of torture equipment, that this experience is one which is terrifying. And then this is exacerbated by the fact that the speaker could not breathe, this uh, claustrophobia, um, and without a key, the speaker again feels her sense of self has been diminished, perhaps to some sort of mechanical, inert object. Um, and finally, this experience of being, or this ritual where she's put into a coffin, is compared to being like midnight. Now, this simile suggests a terrifying darkness, an absence of light. The moment of death uh, in Puritan communities was uh, purported to be this glorious, epiphanic, celestial moment of light where you meet your Redeemer. And here there is a lack of light, very similar to the imagery used in the poem Behind Me Dips Eternity. Dickinson uses anaphora in this stanza with the repetition of the connective and, and, and at the start of three consecutive lines. This perhaps represents a stretching mental agony of the speaker. If we interpret this as a poem of definition, we can interpret this sense of reduction as um, a, uh, a sense that she's being forced to look inwards to her sense of self, uh, examining her own psychological experience. Perhaps this idea of being shaven could be interpreted in another way. Perhaps being shaven um, is this idea that she's that the speaker is, is being stripped down to the core experience of life which she is now examining. The imagery in this stanza is very gothic. Gothic is a genre of literature that attempts to thrill and scare its readers and it's a secular not a sacred uh, use of imagery here um, and so Dickinson is describing this uh, experience of, of death in secular terms not in sacred terms as we might expect someone um, who belongs to the, the Puritan community and actually this fits in with a lot of the scepticism that we see in many of Dickinson's poems about those moments of death. Certainly the idea of being trapped in a coffin without a key with this surrounding imposing darkness is very reminiscent of the thrills of gothic horror stories. Alternatively, this sense of restriction could also refer to Dickinson's very restrictive society, growing up in a strict Puritan community in Ham Amherst and similarly growing up in a more patriarchal society in which women had fewer freedoms and fewer liberties. We could interpret this as Dickinson drawing attention to the way as a female in a Puritan community she felt very much restricted and reduced. Now, in the next stanza, we are met again with another sense of stasis and inertia. Dickinson suggests that there's a terrifying, intimidating silence or void or emptiness that the speaker is met with. Again, it is not this glorious epiphanic or celestial moment. She writes when everything that ticked has stopped. The verb ticked reminds us of a clock, so it suggests that we've moved to this empty, timeless state where there's a sense of stasis. Everything is remaining still. Everything is inert. And it's not only the time that seems to become disordered or, or, or seems to have stopped but also there's a sense that again space is becoming disordered space is staring and a, this personification 
is um, used by Dickinson to suggest that this is an intimidating place that she has moved to, where time has stopped, where space is is voyeuristically staring. Um, and there's a sense of chill, of coldness. That is something that we see in Because I Could Not Stop for Death, that cool, that chill. And not only do we get this with the word frost, but also the adjective grisly, the grisly frost. It suggests something gruesome, something frightful that is about, uh, th that is happening. And Dickinson uses some um, images of, of nature. So first autumn morn, so the autumns of mourning um, are, are adorned with this frost which repeals the beating ground. So repeals suggests that it revokes or, or prevents or the, the beating ground. So the beating ground suggests some sort of life or some sort of energy, but the frost has is, is preventing that. So Dickinson really emphasises a sense of um, life becoming inert, a sense of paralysis. Um, and, and furthermore, we have the homophones, or the homophone with mourn, as in the morning, and to mourn as, as in to lament. So there's definitely a sense here of not this glorious moment um, of death, but something being lost, a uh, mourning. And again, we're reminded perhaps of the mourners as part of the, the rituals, um, the rituals of death. But also this is a really terrifying psychological state if we read this poem as a poem of definition. It's a poem where um, time and space have become distorted, this intimidating emptiness, this intimidating inertia and coldness. This is a mind that is in, in severe depression. In the poem's final stanza, Dickinson continues to attempt to define this experience, whether this is a state, a psychological state, or the experience of death. And she suggests it's like chaos, it's stopless. Here, Dickinson again suggests there is an empty, unending sense of time, the stopless. It is this terrifying continuation that seems to have no end or can seem to find no ultimate conclusion. We are very much uh, left on this sense of inclus inconclusivity, um, which is very typical for Dickinson's poems. Um, and this idea of something being stopless reflects that um, terrifying sense of eternity and because I could not stop for death, that empty that void. Furthermore, Dickinson uses a triple or three caesuri in this line to emphasise that vast emptiness, chaos, stopless, cool. The line is slowed down by the use of the dashes, suggesting this unending sense of time. And there's without a chance, that there seems to be real uh, lack of hope or spa, there's no mast. And here she moves to an image of um, the speaker and and the, the, the speaker and the, the silence almost being stuck at sea together or shipwrecked at sea without any sense of survival or chance of survival or hope because there's no spa. There's no sense of direction. We seem almost directionless without a mast. We cannot, or the speaker cannot control her direction. And again, we can see mirrors of the poem Behind Me Dips Eternity with this imagery of the sea, which Behind Me Dips Eternity ends with, and also this directionless sense of, of, of void, sort of um, this, this directionless sense of, of, of a, a person meaningless and this great void, which all the prepositions in Behind Me Dips Eternity suggest. So the image suggests that there's no direction, um, and there's not even a report of land. There's no evidence, perhaps, of the land suggesting some sort of redeeming afterlife. Um, there's no ultimate destination. A sense of continuous, endless, meaningless travel, much like the end of Because I Could Not Stop for Death, in which um, 
the horses' heads are just pointed in direction and, and they still haven't reached anywhere yet. When that poem, if you remember, shifts to the present tense, we're, we're shockingly realised through that, through that shift that she hasn't, or the speaker hasn't actually real, uh, realised any destination or any final stopping point or any final redemption. Um, the ending of this poem is quite ambiguous. It suggests that um, either that, that there is there is nothing to justify the state of despair, or the syntax suggests that there is reason for despair. There's 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 no port of land to justify, and, and then there's this despair that's separated and fragmented on its own, that final isolated word perhaps summing up the experience of the tortured mental state. And this ambiguity at the end of the poem is very typical for Dickinson. So I hope my quick analysis of this poem has helped you understand some of the key features and some of the key ideas that Dickinson is exploring. Good luck with your own revision of this poem.